going to try and bring you to Scurrig and show you some of the stuff that I've been doing here over the last um, 35 years, uh, messing around with windmills on Scurrig. It's a beautiful place, as you can see from the sunset, although there's no wind evident in that picture. It's also a very windy place. Um, and for those of you who don't know where Scurrig is, um, this is where I've been living up in the northwest of Scotland since the 1970s. Um, it's an off-grid peninsula. It's not actually an island, but it's effectively like an island because you have to, the easiest way to get here is actually to cross the water. Uh, I'm going to try something here where I draw the boat going across the water. Um, and there we are, from Bedlurig to Scurrig, and I live here on the mainland, on the, on the water. Um, and, and as you see, we use fairly small boats um, to come and go, to transport stuff, and there's no mains electricity here. Right, so now we go back in time to the 1970s. Um, long before the internet, in fact, uh, even the telephone was uh, pretty hard to find. There was just one public call box on the peninsula. And uh, mostly what people used for lighting was paraffin lights and candles. Um, my only electricity for the first couple of years was a 12-volt battery for my cassette tape machine to listen to music. And uh, this is my first wind turbine um, that I built, on, which I put on the roof of the house back in 1975. Um, not a good idea, by the way, to put wind turbines on the roof. In those days, there weren't any trees, so it was pretty windy, where well, you can see one tree. But basically, the spray was quite windswept. But even so, having a wind turbine on the roof is very, very noisy, um, transmitted noise throughout the whole building, just from the, this tiny little thing. And it produced maybe five watts to trickle charge my cassette tape recorder battery. Uh, otherwise, I would take the battery with me when I went to Inverness for shopping once a month and charge it up off the vehicle that I was driving. But basically, we lived without electricity for the first couple of years. Um, however, uh, it's a very windy place, and some of my neighbors, one of my neighbors managed to build a wind turbine successfully, so I thought, how hard can it be? And started trying to be really hard. And a lot of my neighbors noticed that I was uh, finally succeeding with it, so they all wanted one too, and so that was how I sort of became the windmill man. Um, actually, if it had been a good hydro site, I would probably have got into hydro and not into wind power at all, because uh, microhydro is a much better option for generating renewable energy on the small scale, much simpler and more reliable. Um, but wind power is good fun. And um, so I don't regret having uh, spent a lot of time tinkering around trying to make it work. I'm doing that today. Also in the picture, you can see a single-bladed machine that my cousin actually built. I carved the blade for it, but he did the rest of the engineering. This is a counterweight. And uh, it was driving an old bus dynamo, which is fairly typical of the sort of generators that we used in those days. Um, it would chug along at uh, about um, 500 RPM, and uh, it was really quite a nice machine, but had a lot of technical issues, as you can imagine. The, the counterweight was one thing, but then there was also the question of um, how, to, uh, how to control the speed, and that was done by a pitch control mechanism, which unfortunately turned out to be a bit unstable. So in the end, although it was a nice concept, it um, had a very high tip-speed ratio, and uh, it was quite a cool thing to have around. In the end, it had to be abandoned. So the biggest challenge in those days was to find some sort of a generator that would work at low enough speed and to make blades that would work at high enough RPM that you could match the two of them together for a direct drive machine. Tinkered about a bit with chain drive. Um, that didn't really work for me. Um, so in the end, it was a case of finding a, a a vehicle generator that would cut in at low enough speed. And around about 1979, 1980, I bought a, a whole pile of dynamos, um, champ jeeps, which would, uh, they were 
designed for 24 volt operation, cutting in at about 1,000 RPM. You could modify the field cost and energized at 12 volts, and that way they would cut in at about uh, 500 RPM. And then I made really high speed two bladed wooden blades, and these were were basically the workhorse for the scurried wind turbines in those days. Everybody had one um, charging 12 volt batteries, maximum it was about 300 watts. <coughs> I went for really quite a complex gravity operated system. The bottom of the tail is on a steering ball joint. Um, then the top of the suspension would be a piece of webbing used for from an old seat belt from a car, wrapping around a cam. And by modifying the shape of this cam, you could modify the um, furling torque. In other words, you could modify how much wind pressure it took to furl the machine. And so you could adjust the, the, uh, the power output in all different wind speeds. It's quite a clever arrangement, I thought, um, but more complex. I did have some problems with the wedding wearing out after a couple of years. So then I went to the simpler arrangement that you can see on my more modern designs. As much as possible, use second-hand materials, um, stuff that I could get off the scrap, the dynamo, so scrap steel, I would use light from the scrap, and even recycled wood for carving the blades. Um, they were quite nice machines. The field coils in them needed to enter. So unlike the permanent magnet machines, um, you couldn't really get any useful at four or five meters a second because that's being used to energy. So there was not, not much point in attempting to get low wind speed performance uh, with dynamos. Writing, um, I wrote uh, a, a series of magazine articles that was later published as a booklet called Scrapyard Wind Power Realities Technology. About 1982, they published it first and subsequently in the months. And you can see blade design um, and also the uh, description of how to rewind the, the um, See if I can. Yeah, I've got my arrow visible. You can see here how to reconnect the field coils within the four-pole machine to get 12 volt output. Um, initially, the field, the brushes would be connected to the all four field coils in series. Um, but by cutting the connection between the middle two field coils, you can actually form them into two parallel groups, each of which gets 12 volts, which is what they want, connected to the brushes. And that way the machine would work at 12 volts. And this was a trick that I used for cutting the cut-in speed down to a level where I could actually manage to build a, a high-speed two-bladed uh, propeller. We used to call them propellers about 1.5 or 2 meters in diameter that would manage to get up to 500 RPM um, at the 4 or 5 meters a second cut-in speed. And these were very... Very simple, reliable machines on the whole. The main problems that we had in the end were with the commutator. Um, the brushes would ride on the copper commutator, and um, and that sooner or later we'd need attention. We need to be cleaned up or possibly skimmed on a lathe or had the brushes replaced. But but quite rugged, reliable machines that generated with good efficiency and strong winds. Not so good in low wind speeds because of the issues with the field coils. Here we are looking at the typical sort of battery banks that we would have had in those days back on Sprague. And um, these were actually batteries from telephone exchanges. We were very lucky in the 1980s that the, uh, the telephone company were swapping out all the telephone exchange batteries. They were modernizing the technology. And in the process, they were scrapping some batteries. Uh, were designed to last for 25 or 30 years, and we were getting these for scrap value or next to nothing, really. And that made a huge difference to the economics of uh, of wind power on Scarborough um, to have a standalone renewable energy system, because in those days we didn't really have any money. And um, as you saw, we were 
using scrap materials for most things. In fact, this is a recent picture, as you may be able to see from the TriStar charge controller and the modern style inverter. But back in the 1980s, they would have just been 12 volt systems. Um, in fact, we wouldn't even have a charge controller in a lot of cases. We just have the batteries and keep an eye on the voltage. And if it was a, a prolonged gale that lasted several days, then you just leave the lights on night and day to prevent the batteries from overcharging. So it was quite a luxury that we had uh, these um, huge old telephone exchange batteries to rely on for our storage. That's one of the big problems, obviously, with standalone renewable energy systems. The balance of system, the batteries and the inverters and all that, that can actually cost more than the wind turbine in, in a lot of cases. And um, that's certainly a, a challenge for, for making these sort of systems affordable. So we were lucky that we were able to uh, get these batteries. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the sort of stuff that we were doing. We'd erect a telegraph pole, guide with fence wires, and then we would um, we would uh, put a piece of water pipe on top of that, guide with fence wires, and then climb up and attach a wind turbine to the top. This one here, the wires were dangling on the outside of the tower. It was before I learned to have them in the middle. So every few days, you'd have to climb up and un twist the wires that would get wrapped around the tower as a result of changes in wind direction. Um, it was good fun. It was quite exhilarating, actually. And I, I, I actually uh, feel some regrets in a way that nowadays I don't get the opportunity to climb up so much. But it was certainly a lot more practical when I learned in the 90s to lower the machine down with a tilt-up tower and use a winch to erect the machine. And I'd certainly recommend tilt-up towers over clambering around up there, but um, but as I say, it was it was quite exhilarating work and and fun to be able to see all around and and often I would look up at the wind turbine and, and wish that I was up there to um, instead of hoisting it up with a winch. Here's another machine with a ball joint on the tail, piece of seatbelt webbing attached to the top of this bracket to uh, to create the furling system. And in the right-hand picture, um, you can see one of my earliest uh, permanent magnet alternators. Because even back then in the 1980s, I was acutely aware of the shortcomings of using vehicle generators. Um, if you were to use a, a, a car alternator, um, you would have really, really dismal efficiency, um, even if you modified it to work at low RPM, that would make the resistance of the windings even higher. And if you used a belt drive, you would get the inefficiencies of the belt drive. And so we were quite lucky in a way to get these cheap dynamos that were fairly efficient actually once the wind got strong enough, but always had this weakness that, that most of the power was being wasted in, in low wind speeds um, in energizing the field coils. So this was one of my first attempts at a permanent magnet alternator. I played around a little bit with uh, uh, wind turbines, many by Berge Wind Power and uh, World Power Technologies. Um, I managed to get hold of second-hand whispers. And I learned that you could make a permanent magnet alternator by putting magnets around the inside of a can, basically. Um, in fact, I used the, the brake drum from a vehicle, and I published plans in the early 90s, which uh, this is actually the year 2000 edition of my brake drum windmill plans that showed how you could, um, I'm going to see if I can draw stuff again on the screen, that showed how you could use a, a brake drum, you could you could line it with magnets all around the inside. Um, in this case, this is a wheel off a lorry from a larger one that I built. But you, you could take the brake drum from a truck, put magnets, the ferrite magnets, which in those days were expensive enough, um, around the inside of the drum. And then you could make a stator inside that. I was a bit stalled for a while how to make the stator, because it should really have external teeth. And all the stator cores that I could find had internal teeth. Um, but then it was actually Gordon Proven who suggested to me that if I took one of these cores and put it inside the magnets with a small gap, maybe about uh, uh, 8 or 10 millimeters, then I could glue coils onto the outside of the core. Here's a coil and another coil. 
and make a three-phase arrangement like this with uh, coils glued in there all around the outside of the steel core facing the magnets and that way you could make quite an effective permanent magnet alternator um, from basic automotive parts and from the laminations out of a standard um, motor. Um, so that was my solution for a DIY permanent magnet alternator for many years. Um, back then in the 90s, that, that was basically what I had to offer. I had experimented with the axial flux concept, but uh, for some reason it didn't work for me first time around. And, um, and so those were the years when I used the, uh, the radial flux design. In the 90s, we also experimented with building some quite large machines. I, I nicknamed these uh, design. I've never actually published the design for these because um, they rely on a very elaborate blade manufacture system that I, in the end, wasn't really convinced was something other people would benefit from. Um, here you can see, perhaps, I don't know how fast the slides are loading, but here you should be able to see the mold that we used. And at each station, I printed out the shape of the blade, and then that was cut out of pieces of heavy plywood. And then half of that shape was made to open up so that we could insert the central spar and the two pieces of plywood that comprised the windward and the downwind side of the blade. You could then close this mold down and clamp it onto the uh, shape of the blade so as to glue the whole thing together and achieve the correct aerodynamic shape. Um, this was only really possible because my cousin Tov expert with plywood and epoxy and uh, as I say I wouldn't really recommend this approach but we built a number of machines using this technology on Scorig and they produce four or five kilowatts, uh, most of which we actually use for heating. But the beauty of it is that in low wind speeds you've got a five meter diameter machine even in quite a light wind that's capable of kicking out a few hundred watts and uh, if, if you're looking for, for a really reliable source of energy from the wind because the wind is so fickle um, it is quite important to have that large rotor diameter and actually the couple hundred watts that you get in low winds was probably worth more than the five kilowatts of heat that we can get from this machine in high winds because of the value of electricity as, a, as opposed to heat. This is, uh, this is the uh, alternator um, it's a direct 48 volt battery charging machine um, and the blades are 5.6 meter diameter. You can see them coming out of the workshop where we balance them. We had to balance them in the workshop because it wasn't really possible to get calm enough weather to balance them on the tower on the machine and, and there was nowhere where you could actually uh, spin them in, in, in a workshop so I had to balance them on a spike. Um, here in the lower right-hand picture, you can see the furling mechanism is rather complex. Um, essentially, the, 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 bottom, the bottom of the tail here runs down to, uh, to a um, ball joint. Um, the top one is suspended from a chain that wraps around this cam here. And uh, so it's similar to the seatbelt webbing design. By altering the shape of that cam, I'm able to alter the power output in fact, I've never had to alter it with this one because I got it right first go, pretty much. But, uh, but it does give um, a more flexible and a more appropriate tail vane torque over the whole range of its swing. And here you can see the stator mounts are pieces of pipe going out. It's a flat bar going out and another bit of flat bar across to meet these two mounting points here and here. So there's three, three stator mounts that are T-shaped like that to uh, support the, the large stator on here. I think the magnet rotor is 66 centimeters in diameter in this case. So it's quite a big machine. And uh, here we can see my house and you can see the machine being erected. Um, so it is possible to, um, to have a successful uh, five, six meter diameter machine using the same furling arrangements. And of course, this has already been proved in Colorado by the other power guys. 
um, who have built similar sized machines. You can see here the top chain wrapping around the cam. And this is this bottom chain here. Oops. You can see the top chain wrapping around the cam. And this chain here is a stop chain that supports the uh, tail, stops the tail from swinging all the way down into the blades. Um, okay, now what's interesting about the electrical system is the way that it uses heaters to create effectively a maximum power point tracking power speed characteristic for the blades. Uh, this is a schematic diagram of the, the windmill and the brake switch is connected directly to it. Um, I'm going to show my arrow here. So here's the windmill and here's the brake switch connected directly to the AC wiring feeding to the rectifier. Now the DC plus, rather than going straight to the battery plus, passes through these heaters in series. In low wind speeds, the heaters don't kick up much power because the power in the heaters is proportional to the square air current, so most of the actual energy from the wind goes into the battery. Um, as the current increases, um, you'll find that the, uh, for example, in this case where it's producing 35 amps, um, the 48 volt battery is at, say, 58 volts, so you'll be 2 kilowatts. You've got almost 2 kilowatts going into these heaters that are connected in series, and they're just directly warming this. And the result electrically uh, can be seen in this curve here, where the uh, the DC voltage is rising with the power of the machine, and that and that allows the blades to run faster in stronger winds, and uh, greatly improves the efficiency of both the alternator and the blades over a wide range of wind speeds. Enables us to get. Uh, peak outputs of up to 10 kilowatts. There's actually a trip that trips in a braking load at that point to prevent it from overloading in gusts. Most of the time the furling system will prevent it reaching that for any sustained period. Um, so I would guess the average output of the machine is probably more like 4 kilowatts, 5 kilowatts, although it can gust up to 7 or 10 kilowatts safely without damage. Um, so there we go. This is my power room. Um, nowadays I need two 3 kilowatt inverters to use all the power that we're getting. Also got uh, a classic, a midnight classic controller here that I've been testing on the African wind power machine at the back of the house. I've got a Morningstar one that I'm playing around with as well. Um, they're great fun to play with. I'm not sure that I would be able to afford to actually buy one or justify the cost, partly because of the issues with protecting them against um, over-voltage. The Midnight suggests that you also buy this clipper, which costs, I don't know, maybe a couple of thousand dollars, um, in addition to the maybe $800 that you spend on the Classic. And uh, really, I can't make this stack up in terms of economics. Um, for a low system, um, whereas putting heaters in series, provided you've got a use for that heat, is a much more effective method of um, method of creating a, a very simple, very efficient, low-tech, maximum power point tracking design for a small wind turbine. Uh, which kind of brings me to the end of my little tour, my little um, rambling on various different stuff that I've been doing over the years. I hope that's given you some idea of um, the range of possibilities. Um, the recipe book, although I've tried to make it into a complete and coherent description, isn't the be-all and end-all. There's tons of other stuff you can do. And I'm in touch with a lot of you on the internet. I'd like to remain in touch and keep in touch with more people to discuss these sort of ideas and to work together to develop um, more concepts, more reliable small winter, keep those blades turning. So thanks for listening, and I hope you have fun in the conference. And uh, that's it for me for now.